Good day, grade 11s. Um, I hope that you've had an awesome day so far and that you are ready to learn a little bit more about probability. So let's get started. First of all, we're going to revise some of the terminology. Um, I do find that probability, because it's quite new to the curriculum, it's only been in the curriculum for the last year or so, or last two, three years, um, that a lot of people still struggle with it. Um, and some of the teachers tend to skip it out in grade 10 and then only deal with it in grade 11 and 12, which means that sometimes you get into grade 11 and you don't know the words. So let's revise it, okay? So first of all, let's talk about an experiment. This refers to an uncertain process. Okay, we're not talking about a scientific experiment here where we try and blow something up. We're talking about something as simple as flipping a coin or throwing a die um, a number of times. Okay, so basically anything where you're looking to see what an outcome is, that is an experiment. Your outcome is a single result to your experiment. So when you flip your coin, you're either going to get heads or tails, right? If you throw a dice, you're going to get one or die. You're going to get one through to six. Okay, so those are your outcomes. Um, a sample space is a number of possible outcomes that you can have. So again, when you throw in your coin, your options are either that you could have heads or tails, right? So the sample space includes all the possible outcomes of your experiment. Your die, your sample space again is one, two, three, four, five, six. Remember, die, just remind you, is a single, a single. Um, in other words, when we say dice, we actually mean two little cubes with the dots on, okay? Dice is the plural, okay? Die is one of them, which is why the die is one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, the num N of S is the number of outcomes in the sample space. So obviously, the number of outcomes in the sample space here, where the coin is being thrown is just two, it's either heads or tails. And the number of outcomes for the sample space for the throwing of the die would be six because it can either land or show side one, two, three, four, five, or six. Okay, pretty obvious, right? Now, event is a specific outcome. So, in other words, if you want the it. To, when you when you throw the die, you want a six to come up. That is a, a specific event. So if I flip get tails when I flip a coin, that is the event. If I throw a six when I roll the dice, that is the event. An event is a specific outcome that we're hoping for. So we usually talk about events as in what is the probability of that happening? What is the probability of the event happening? Okay. The number of events is obviously a number of the elements in the subset. So for both of these, the number of elements in the subset is one, right? Oh, sorry about that. So probability, for example, of an event is a real number between naught and one. Okay, so what we're saying is that Either it can happen or it doesn't happen, right? So the probability of an event is a real number between naught and one. It describes how likely the event will happen. And obviously the closer you are to one, the more likely it'll happen. The closer you are to zero, the less likely it'll happen. So for example, the probability of getting a tail when flipping the coin is 0,5. Why? For the simple reason that you don't, you've only got two options, okay? So therefore it's 50% chance of getting tails and 50% chance of getting heads. So therefore the probability of getting a tail when from the coin is 0, 0,5. Now we need to talk about a relative frequency. This is of an, a relative frequency of an event is the number of times that the event occurs during experimental trials divided by the total number of trials. So for example, if a quick flip, flip a coin 10 times, okay, I don't know why that's over there. That's actually supposed to be over there, it's seven over 10. Okay, if we flip a coin 10 times and it lands on heads seven times, then the relative frequency would be seven out of 10 or 0.7. Now notice the difference here. The, 
if you flip a coin, at each time you flip the coin, there's a probability that you will, there's 50% chance that it will give you either a tail or heads, right? But relative frequency is what actually happens. So then if we flip the coin 10 times and in that specific, those specific 10 times, it lands on head seven times, then the relative frequency of getting heads is 0,7. Or we could say the relative frequency of getting tails, tails, is 0,3. So notice that there's a difference between the probability and the relative frequency. Relative frequency is what actually happens, happens, whereas probability is what theoretically could happen. Theoretically could happen. Okay, so that is important. Um, the main reason this is important is because a lot of people bank on probabilities when they talk when they do gambling and stuff like that whereas you actually need to look at the relative frequency to see if what you're doing is accurate or not now let's talk about sets and unions of sets etc so in the union of events is a set of all the outcomes that occur in at least one of the events so the notation is A union B. So an example would be if you've got set, oh, I don't know what happened there. If you've got set one, two, three, and four, and set B369, the new union of a set is going to be everything that's in it occurs in at least one of the events. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, six, and nine. Because it has to occur in at least one of the two. Right. Whereas intersection of events is a set of all the outcomes that occur in all the events. So it has to occur in every single set of events that you've got. So the notation is A, and I always think of this looking like an N. Okay, so it's A is the in A intersection B. So an example would be one, two, three, four, and three, six, nine. The only thing that's occurring in both of these is three. Do you see that? So the intersection, A intersection B is the set three or is three. Now we need to talk about mutually exclusive events. This is very important. These are events with no outcomes in common. Okay, these events can never occur simultaneously. Um, one example would be if set A is all the even numbers and set B is all the odd numbers, then A and B, or A union B, or no, no, A union B, A intersection B is going to be zero. It's an empty set, right? In other words, what we're saying is A intersection B is zero. There is nothing in both. Another example would be you can't go to the movies and be home at the same time. Okay? You either go out and watch the movies. I'm not talking about watching Netflix or whatever at home. I'm talking about either you go out, buy the popcorn, go to the movies, watch it on the big screen, or you stay home. You can't do both things simultaneously. And that those are mutually exclusive events. Complementary events are two mutually exclusive events that together contain all the outcomes in the sample space. So if the event is called A, then the complement is called not A. So the notation would be A dashed, okay? And this notation here, this here means not A. A. So complementary events are two mutually exclusive events that together contain all the outcomes in the sample space. If the event is called A, then the complement is called not A. Right, so now let's do a little bit of revision of Venn diagrams. Firstly, a Venn diagram is a graphical way of representing relationships between sets. You'll find yourself drawing Venn diagrams a lot if when you do these probability questions, either Venn diagrams or tree diagrams, for the simple reason that it helps us understand what's going on and helps us solve problems. So each set of information is represented by a circle. 
So this big square here is a universe, universal set and it includes everything in, that could be included, okay? Then yeah, you've got set A, B and C and yeah, you've got set A, set B, set C. So do you see that there is a bit of overlapping with set A and set B, yeah? Whereas set A, set B and C, set C, there's no uh, overlapping. Okay, so we would say that set A, set B, set C are mutually exclusive because they can't happen at the same time. Now the union of the set, okay, the union of the set, remember, is everything, if, for example, if I went A, union B, A, union B would be everything in A plus everything in B. Do you understand? So it's everything in A and everything in B. So, or if I went A union B, sorry, union C, it would be everything in A and everything in C. At the moment, the fact that this is grayed out and the fact that this is all white is showing us that we're looking at A union B union C. So we're looking at everything in these three circles. The intersection, remember, occurs in either A or B. So the intersection occurs in either A or B. Okay, so in other words, A intersection B is going to be all of this. That there is A intersection B, right? It's stuff that occurs in both A, sorry, let's put this way, A and B, right? A and B. Whereas if we had B intersection C, it is everything over here. And obviously this would be A intersection C. Now this little triangle in the middle, or sort of triangle in the middle, that is the sweet spot. That is the intersection of all three. Okay, all three. Now, let's talk about the complement of a set. Now we've already spoken about this already. The complement means not. Okay, this complement of a set is not. So if we're looking at not B, the dark gray here, is not B. So everything that's not in B is the complement of B. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about more, more let's talk more about mutually exclusive. Do you see that yeah if they're mutually exclusive okay it means that they cannot occur at the same time. But then if we talk about A union B, A union B of mutually exclusive things is just everything in both A and B, okay? And it doesn't matter if it's mutually exclusive or not mutually exclusive, it is everything in A and B, okay? Whereas the intersection of mutually exclusive stuff is zero. So this set here, the set of A intersection B is zero. Whereas if it's not mutually exclusive, it's going to overlap and then you'll have something that's in the set A intersection B. Now let's do an example. The best way to do these is to do the examples. Okay, so let's have a look. It says there are 220 boys in grade 11, 160 play rugby, 110 play cricket, 70 play rugby and cricket. Illustrate this information on a Venn diagram. Okay, so we only got two Venn diagrams here. Two Venn diagrams. I mean, two circles in our Venn diagram. Do you agree that one is rugby and the other one is cricket? Okay. Now they tell us that there are 220 boys in our universal set. So we know that there are 220 boys in this total set. They also say that there are 70 that play rugby and cricket, 70. So we know that the intersection of seven, of rugby and cricket is 70, this bit here, okay? 
now now they want us to work out the rest but here's the tricky thing the whole of this the whole of this the all of the kids that play rugby including the kids that play cricket is 160. so therefore do you agree that the kids that just play cricket are going to be 160 minus 70 which equals 90. so therefore this is 90 because 90 plus 70 is 160. Similarly, all of this is 110. Okay, all of that's 110. So therefore, we can say that 110 minus 70 equals 40. So there are 40 kids that just play cricket. Now, finally, what we need to do is we need to add this up and see if this adds up to 220. So we've got 90, 70, and 40. That's obviously a zero. Nine and four is 13 plus seven is 200. So there are 20 kids that are, don't play rugby or cricket. They are not inside this group, these, these circles. Now it says, find the probability that the boy chosen at random plays rugby or cricket. Okay. So the kids here in the middle, they play rugby and cricket. Do you agree? Rugby or cricket is all of this. So the chances that they play rugby or cricket is going to be 200 out of 220, which can be broken down to 100 over 110, sorry, 100 over 110, which can be broken down to 10 over 11. So the probability is 10 over 11 that a boy chosen random plays either rugby or cricket. Plays neither rugby or no cricket, well, that's going to be your last bit of 20. So this one here is that there's 20 out of the 220 that play neither rugby nor cricket which we can cancel, and that's 2 over 22, which is 1 out of 11. So 1 out of 11, do not, 1 in 11 is the probability that a boy chosen random does not play rugby or cricket. And obviously you can change that to percentage if you want. Right, now let's talk about dependent versus independent events. Okay, it seems pretty obvious what that is, okay, when you think about it. If an, if an event can only occur if a previous event has happened, then we call it a dependent event, okay? Um, for example, Thursday follows Wednesday. That is a dependent event, okay? Um, for another example, it's a silly example, but it's one that works. Your mom tells you that you can only have dessert if you eat all your veggies. Okay, that is a dependent event. Or your mom says that you can go watch movies if you get an A for your maths test. That is a dependent event. It depends on the one thing for the other thing to happen. An independent event can occur even if another event has not happened i.e. the probability of one event occurring does not affect the probability of the other events occur. For example, and this is where a lot of people make errors when it comes to um, gambling and that. If you throw a coin twice, then there is no guarantee that both times will be tails or both times will be heads or if it was this heads and the next one has to be tails or whatever. The, object that you're throwing the coin is an inanimate object and it does not know what you threw beforehand so therefore throwing the coin or tossing a die or whatever is not going to be a dependent event it's going to be independent another independent event would be guessing multiple choice I know how you guys think. You think, oh, look, I'm doing my multiple choice. Oh, I've had four A's in a row. Um, I must have made a mistake. Please understand that, again, every multiple choice question is supposed to be done on an independent um, knowledge set. In other words, question A might be on colors and question B might be on numbers. So nobody's looking to see, oh, look, the answers are A, 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 A. They don't care. 
all they're doing is testing your ability on each separate question, okay? So therefore, that's an independent event. Now, the independent events are easier to calculate, okay? And this is the definition. Two events are independent if and only if the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. So they are independent if the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. Okay. So let's look at an example. We've got a bag and it contains five red balls. Okay, wait a minute. Five red balls. One, two, three, four, five, and five green balls. One, two, three, four, five. We remove a random ball from the bag, note its color, then return it to the bag. We then remove another ball and note its color. Okay. What is the probability that the first ball is red? Well, if you think about it, the probability the first ball is red is going to be 5 out of 10. There are 10 balls in total, but only 5 of them are red. So therefore, the probability that the first ball will be red is 5 out of 10, which is the same as a half, which makes sense because half of them are red and half of them are green. What is the probability the second ball is green is also going to again be 5 over 10 or a half. And the reason for this is that we returned the, the ball to the bag. If we hadn't returned it, then this probability would be different, okay? But since we returned it, the probability is again 5 out of 10, which is 0 0.5. Now it says, what is the probability that the first ball is red and the second ball is green? So if you think about it, the probability of the first red, second green is 5 over 10 multiplied by 5 over 10, which is 25 over 100, which is a quarter. So there's a 25% chance or at 25% probability that if the first ball is red, then the second ball will be green. Now it says, is the fact that the first ball is red and the second ball is green independent or dependent? Okay, so remember what the rule is. The rule is the probability of A and B has to equal the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B for it to be independent. So the probability of the first red ball is a half. The probability of the second red ball being the second ball being green is a half. Therefore, do you agree that the probability of the first ball red and the second green we've already worked out? That's a quarter. And a half times a half is a quarter. Therefore, these are independent. So therefore, we can't tell that if we pulled out the red ball that the second pool is green. There's no ne no necessary dependency. It doesn't, in other words, the second ball's color doesn't depend on what the first ball color was. And that's because of the fact that we're removing one of the ball colors. Okay, when putting it back. Now let's look at Venn diagrams with three events. And we've already kind of spoken about it, where you can see that this is the sample space, this is A, B, and C, and this here would be the intersection of A, B, and C. And the best way to do this is to go through an example. So there are 200 learners in grade 11, 100 of them, seven of them learn art, 23 take art and graphic design, 190 take art, dance, or graphic design, 63 take graphic design, 90 take dance, and 35 take dance and art, 15 take dance, art, and design. And it says how many learners take graphic design and dance, um, but not art. Okay, so first of all, we're going to call this top circle the dance. Okay, we're going to call this bottom circle the art, and we're going to call this bottom circle the graphic 
design. And the first thing they tell us is that 15 learners take art, dance, and design. So we're going to pop that 15 right in the middle. Okay, since we now know that that's 15, that makes life a little bit easier. So we've worked that out. Okay, 15 learners take art, dance, and design. Okay, now we know that 35 learners take dance and art. So 35 learners take dance and art. So that means that the whole of this has to be equal to 35. Do you agree? But this is 15, so what's left is 20. Right? Do you see that? The whole of this has to be 35, but 35 minus 15 is equal to 20. Therefore, this is 20. Okay, next. The next thing they tell us is that 23 learners take art and graphic design. Let me just change to green. So 23 learners take art and graphic design. But now, of those 15 take art, so therefore we are left with, oh, sorry, I had the wrong color. Um, hang on a minute, uh, just a second. I had the wrong um, thing. Art and graphic design on the bottom one. So this is art, I mean, that's art. And this is graphic design. So all together, this has to be 23. So therefore, that's 15 and that's 8. So we've done that one. Okay, next. Let's see what else we know. 111 students take art all together. So do you see now we don't have any other sp open spaces for art other than the one where we know exactly what the student is taking and they're taking art, okay? So we know that all of this, X, plus this, plus this, plus this, has to add up to 107. So we got 107 minus 20, minus 15, minus eight, is going to give me the X, the students for the art. And that comes to 64. That comes to 64. So now we've done the purple lot. Okay, the purple lot, the 64. Now let's see what else there is. 190 learners take art or dance or graphic design. 63 learners take graphic design. Okay, that doesn't help us. 90 learners take dance. Okay, that doesn't help us. So now we need to think about letting something equal X. So what we're going to do is we're going to let the whole of this, the dance and the graphic design, the whole of this equal X. Okay, that means that now we can say that okay since we've got the dancers all the dancers where am i with dancing we've got i've done the 35 learners okay we've got we're now doing 90 learners take dance okay so do you agree that 90 plus x okay plus 20, oh, let's try again. Okay, so do you agree that this bit here, which we're going to call D, D, is going to be 90 minus 20 minus 15 minus X, okay? So 20 minus, 90 minus 20 is 70, minus 15 is 55 minus X. So therefore, this area here is 55 minus X. Now, we can play with the graphic designers. So we also know that 63 learners take graphic design. So therefore, we can say 63 minus 8 minus 15 minus X equals this bit here. And we end up with 40 minus X. That's right. Now they tell us 190 learners take art or dance or graphic design. What does that mean? That means that 55 minus X plus X plus 40 minus X plus 20 plus 15 plus 8 plus 64 all has to equal, where is it, 190. So those happily cancel, and you've got, sure, I wonder if I've written it down somewhere, I don't think I did. 
Hang on. And I didn't have to actually work it out. So therefore, we've got 55 plus 40 is 95, 105, 120, 128. 128 plus 64, that is 12, carry one, that's, seven, that's 80, 92, hmm, that's 192, that's not going to work. <sighs> Let's check this again, so we've got 55 minus x, x, 40 minus x, 8, 15, 20, 64, oh, sorry, 190, let take out or down, so, okay, now I'm right. So, and we know that they're 10 out there, it doesn't matter. So now what are we doing? We're trying to find out what X is, am I right? So let me just erase some stuff here, so I've got space to write. Um, okay, so we're going 55 minus X plus X plus 40 minus X is equal to 35, sorry, plus 35, plus 72 equals 190, okay? Because 190 take art or design or graphic design. So now minus x cancel plus x, you've got 55 plus 40 is 95, Plus 35 is, okay, wait, I'm just going to get up my, okay, wait. So it's 55 plus 40 plus 35 plus 72. That's 10, that's 12, carry 1. That's 9, 10. I get 202. Oh, that's right. So it's 202 minus x equals 190. So therefore, minus x is going to be 190 minus 202. Therefore, x is going to be what? It's going to be 12. So x is 12, and then you can work out the rest. Okay, then it says, how many learners take graphic design and dance, but not art? How many learners take graphic design and dance? Graphic design and dance and dance, but not art. It would only be 12. There you go. That was a nice question. Hey, let's move on. Now we're going to talk about tree diagrams. So this is useful for organizing and visualizing the different possible outcomes of a sequence of events. Okay, so this is obviously dependent. For each possible outcome of the event, we draw a line and next we write the probability. So let's do an example. We've got a bag, it contains five red balls and three blue balls. There is a second bag, it contains six blue balls and four red balls. If a ball is selected from one of the bags, find the probability that the ball will be blue. Okay, so first we need to select a bag. Okay, so let's have a look at it. First of all, we're going to go bag number one and bag number two. So you've got options. You can either call bag one or we can call bag two. So either you've got 50% of pulling bag one or you've got 50% of pulling bag two. Right. Now bag one has got five red balls, so bag one has got five red balls and bag two contains four red balls, four red balls, okay, whereas bag one has got three blue balls, three blue balls, and this has got six, six blue balls, okay, it says if the ball is selected from random from one of the bags, find the probability that the ball will be blue. Okay, so follow the branches. You've got, um, okay, I haven't finished. So do you agree that this is a half? This is five out of eight balls, but this is three out of eight balls. However, this is four out of six plus four is ten which is two-fifths, or this year is five out of ten, six out of ten, which is three-fifths. 
Okay, so now it says, find the probability that the ball will be blue. So we're either going to go this route here, so we're going to choose bag one, which is 50% chance, and then pull out one of these blue balls, which is 3 eighths. Or what we're going to do is go through bag, a bag two, which is 50% to get that, multiplied by the chances of getting the blue ball back over here, um, what is going on here? Six blue balls. Okay, so it's three fifths. Three fifths. So therefore we can say, well, that is three over 16 plus um, three over 10. And you can see that we've added it up here and it works out to be 0 0.49. So the probability of the ball being selected being blue is not comma four nine. Let's look at a couple of other probabilities. The probability that this the day will be sunny tomorrow is a third. If it is sunny, the probability that Jenny plays tennis is four fifths. If it is not sunny, the probability that Jenny plays tennis is two fifths. It says find the probability that Jenny plays tennis. Okay, so let's do this one. Sorry, I thought I had a drawing for it. So we have the probability of it being sunny or not sunny. If it is sunny, it is one third probability. If it is not sunny, then it's two thirds probability, right? Assuming. Then we also have if it is sunny, the probability that Jenny plays tennis is four fifths. So plays tennis is four fifths. So obviously not play tennis is one fifth. Okay, similarly over here. Um, if it is not sunny, the probability that Jenny plays tennis is two fifths. So if it's not sunny, the probability that she plays tennis is two fifths and probably that you won't play tennis is obviously three fifths. Calculate the probability that Jenny plays tennis. Okay, so let's get going. Okay, it's first the probability that Sunny multiplied by the probability that she'll play tennis, which is four fifths, plus the probability that it's not Sunny, which is two thirds, multiplied by the probability that she will play tennis, um, which is two fifths. Therefore, we've got four out of five times three is 15 plus four over five times three is 15, which is just gonna be eight over 15. So the probability that Janice will play tennis is eight out of 15. Okay, grade 11, so we will carry on doing probability and probability type questions in our next lesson, which is on Monday. Have a great day.